Okay, um, hello everyone. It's really nice to be back here doing these uh, calf crop meetings. They were very enjoyable earlier on in the year and uh, great to see a good turnout tonight as well. I'm going to discuss um, nutritional management for a stress-free weaning. Um, and what I did want to stress myself was that, uh, that um, everyone's system is completely different. We've all got different numbers. We've got different breeding. We've got, you know, in-wintering, out-wintering um, and, and different feeding systems. So what I'm going to discuss tonight is just to give you food for thought um, where you can make small improvements on your system. And there's no sort of one size fits all. There's lots of different methods of doing it. Um, and the, the key is to get the nutrition right to, to reduce that stress um, in conjunction with what Alwyn's going to say from, from a veterinary side um, of things. So um, the nutritional role in a smooth weaning, we, we need to consider what the aim of the calf is. So um, every calf really should get the best quality feed as it possibly can um, at weaning time and after weaning um, to minimise its stress levels. Um, and the timing of, of when we, we do this will depend on grass availability, cow condition and milk. Um, I mean, obviously some people wean on the same day every year. Um, and thinking back to... Um, you know, kind of going back a bit, your calving period, the more spread out it is, the, the bigger the different ages you're going to have of calves. Um, and, and that does make a stress um, free weaning quite complicated if you've got some young calves and some older calves. So that's something to think about um, retrospectively as well for, for another time. But um, I, I think... Uh, the important message I want to get across from the very start is that when a calf is four months old, half of its nutrition comes from milk and half comes from other sources. And by the time it's six months old, 75% of its nutrition is coming from other sources other than milk. So even if you are delaying weaning um, or you are um, creep grazing or you're creep feeding, um, it's important to remember that, you know, three quarters of that animal's intake is not from milk. So what you put into it has to be good quality and whatever method um, or route you're going down. So I'm just going to have a look at uh, um, creep feeding first of all. Um, traditionally we would probably creep feed to um, you know say six weeks before weaning as a as to relieve stress to make the most of efficient feed conversion um, and you know that would be two um, to three kilos of creep feed to get the cattle adjusted for coming inside and lowering the stress um, of them coming inside. Um, however, there's some you know cons to that as in the cost of it and um, you know if there's plentiful grass in front of them there'll be a substitution effect of they will eat more creep feed and not enough grass but also um, what I do see quite a lot is you know folk wanting to keep cows out longer if the weather's good in the back end and that's perfectly understandable but what happens is that there's not an awful lot of grass here which is maybe fine for the cows at that stage of pregnancy but you get the calves eating you know a horrendous amount of creep so maybe six kilos of creep or more sometimes and then when we bring them into the house then we're kind of you know taking them off the six kilos maybe putting them on a couple of kilos and, and put them on silage and things so that also includes a stress factor but also we find that um, sometimes heifer calves are getting too fat if they're eating that level of creep and then you're kind of taking them down again. Um, it's not terribly, terribly productive for them. And if, you know, the common sort of complaint I get from people is that heifers are going away too light and too fat. So maybe that needs to be looked at in your system as well. You know, whether you're just feeding um, the bull calves or feeding heifer calves as well. Um, there was a paper done at Harper Adams um, by Simon Marsh in 2014, and they looked at autumn-born um, calves. So it, uh, slightly different on, the, on their feeding system. They've not got the spring grass like, like the spring-born calves do, but they looked at crude protein levels of 13% in the fresh weight and 16% and that effect on growth rates um, in, in the calves. And what they found was that there was no effect on growth rates um, for heifers, but they did find that the bull calves on the higher protein feed did do better and significantly better. Um, so what I would say, though, is that obviously that's in an autumn study, so they've not got the fresh grass here. So when you're looking at what to keep feed, something about 14% in crude protein and a high energy, good quality, palatable feed is what you're aiming for. Um, I've put some references at the back um, at the end that you can find out more information on, on what to creep feed. Um, also, there was a, a, a paper done in um, Australia. Now, it was feedlot cattle um, and a, a large number of cattle. I think it was over 3,000 cattle that were in this study. And they um, 
when they introduced hard feed before putting cattle into the feedlots, um, they, they had less incidence of respiratory disease. So I think it was 25% incidence in the ones that were un, you know, not conditioned to hard feed compared to 16% in the ones that were um, conditioned to hard feed. So I know that's an, an Australian study, but I think it's, it's still um, worth sort of, of uh, keeping at the back of your mind. So just looking at the cost of creep, if we're taking a, a creep of £250 a tonne, if they're eating um, a couple of kilos a day, it's 50 pence a day. But then, as I was saying, you know, if you're getting into the scenario in the autumn time where there's not enough grass here and they're eating a lot of creep, it's creeping up to, um, you know, a pound fifty a day, which is is pretty, pretty uh, uh, pricey. Um, where good grazing would be around a fifth of that cost. And I know that in not all systems you can you can use grass um, uh, and especially it depends on the weather and the, the year and things like that but if you can make more use of your grass um, you know you're getting a lot um, cheaper a dry matter source of energy for these calves and it has to be good quality grass right enough um, so think about on your farm can you utilize your grass better um, and again it comes down to the aim of the cattle so obviously if you're selling at weaning time you probably want to create feed and get as much you know, um, weight gain and bloom on those calves as possible for selling. If you're selling at a year, um, looking at, um, you know, moderate weight gains, or if you're extensive finishing, you maybe not want to have creep at all and, and reducing the cross that way and, and, you know, native cattle and things. Um, so there's all, and if you're keeping them for breeding too, if you're meeting your targets without creep feeding for heifers, it's a consideration that you maybe don't need to start as early creep feeding. So there's loads of factors involved in the decision making, um, but the costs there, um, you know, do make you think about, you know, whether you are needing to and whether it does suit your system. So think about these things on your own farm um, and, and what you're doing. So creep grazing as well. I think this is something that is really underutilized is, um, you know, allowing calves to go forward and keep grazing over the summer um, or in the, in the back end, keeping the cows back a little and um, allowing the calves through into better pasture. And you can do a combination of keep grazing and keep feeding um, to, to help with cost too. Um, it's brilliant because it encourages self weaning. The cattle are very settled after you've been doing this and also makes use of grass if you've got um, extra grass at that time. And if the grass has been managed well. Um, however, it does rely on good grass availability and, and good weather, um, and it doesn't really prepare them for that indoor diet um, of, of going on to some hard feed. So some people would argue you get lower weight gains as well, but there's there's a, a good few farmers doing um, you know, weaning straight off grass and, and the weight gains are, are fantastic. So I think that's debatable depending on, on the grassland management um, that's there. So um, it's also worth the remembering though that that creep feed does substitute good grass so if you can you can get the grass management right and things and then that can maybe um encourage um creep feeding a wee bit later but it's it's just different methods of um of making it a softer weaning um nutritionally for these calves the other option is delayed weaning um, and advantage of that keeping the weight off the cow and you know people who are are not um uh, weaning the calves in November and December, they, they do get a, a, a good advantage that they're not getting so much pneumonia. But what I would say is nutritionally, really need to remember that this calf is getting, you know, 75% of its nutrition not from milk. So it can't just be pinching its mum's ration. It has to have a separate creep area where it's getting well fed if you want the weight gains to be um, growing well. So um, while it might seem an advantage to delay weaning for reducing stress, if the nutritional part of it isn't correct, um, you know, weight gains will suffer. So really consider that if you are delaying weaning. Um, in, in your herd. So I just want to talk about once we've weaned the calves, the, the quality of the forages that the calves are going on to. Um, it's really important that at this stage that they are given um, as digestible and as appetizing forage as possible because intakes are key. If you've not got good intakes, you're not going to get good weight gains. And also um, good intakes and, and, um, and keeping the cattle content and not stressed um, is going to help with um, their immune response as well. So when you've got the forages, no matter what you're feeding, whether it's cover crops, um, silage, hay, um, check for dry matter, energy and protein. That's the three main things, dry matter, energy and protein, because these three factors um, will determine how much forage they will eat. And it also determines how much supplements you feed. So if you think back to the cost um, I was talking about of um, 
of feeding, um, you know, 25 pence a kilo. Um, if you're feeding an extra couple of kilos that you maybe don't have to be 50 pence a day, you know, for 100 cattle, 50 quid a day, it all adds up. So um, that's the three, three things. So dry matter, energy and protein. And if you do find yourself in a situation where, you know, the calves, you know, you've got poor or silage um, and you know maybe it's wet and um, the, the cattle are not eating it and, and you know putting straw in or adding molasses there are things you can do to make it more palatable um, but monitoring the intakes and making sure that they are getting that um, feed into them um, is, is absolutely key for reducing that stress so um, I can't stress that enough actually about the, the forage um, and, and making sure you know you know what you've you've got so my top tips really for um, are making sure that your base ration is as good as it can be. So know the quality of your forage. Um, it only takes half an hour and honestly, it's the best day, the best half hour you'll spend um, to, to ensure that you're going to get the calves, um, uh, you know, motoring. Um, keep the feed fresh and appetising and monitoring intake. So if you're feeding every other day, um, make sure, you know, that, you know, if you, if you can clean, clean it away and let the cows eat some of the stuff that's left over, don't make the calves clean up um, because they will struggle to get their intakes and then again struggle with weight gains. Um, minerals, I think if you can know the facts, what's on your farm and what you're likely to be deficient in and, and not assuming, so again, forage analysis and, and, and checking things out. Um, I think... I mean, most of your proprietary feeds, if you're if you're feeding them um, three to four kilos of them, are going to give the cattle all the the minerals they really need, um, except if there is some major deficiencies going on. Um, and if you are feeding a proprietary mineral, um, just a, 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 G, a general purpose mineral, about seventy grams of a general purpose mineral should be absolutely adequate for just weaned calves. Um, and I'd also encourage you just to look at the whole picture. So rather than looking for a quick fix nutritionally, you know, if you think the cattle are not doing so well, it must be the feed quality or um, intakes are, you know, are not so good. Um, so look at the access to the feed and again, check the energy, protein, minerals and health where, and where improvements can be made. So, um, you know, sometimes um, my final note would be that small changes can, can lead to big improvements by just taking a step back. Um, and I know that sometimes with weaning, it, 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 uh, you know, it's a busy time on the farm with other things as well. So um, just stay, taking a step back and, and looking at what nutritional changes you can make will, will uh, drastically reduce the stress um, on the cattle as well. So I've just popped some references there. So I've rattled through that quite quickly. Um, I've, I've put some, the, the top reference there is just the in, uh, the farm advisory service about creep feeding um, and what, what to use, if um, some information there. And also there's the, um, a mineral guide on the, the advisory service there and the other two papers I was talking about um, from Simon Marsh and um, the Australian paper as well. So thank you for listening. I'm sorry I have rattled through that quite quickly and I'm really happy to take any questions later on after Alwyn's talk as well. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Uh, in the meantime, I've managed to fix my web webcam, so I don't know if that's a treat or a curse for everyone, but there we go. Uh, Alan, do you want to jump on? As, as Karen, as you said, there's plenty of time for questions at the end, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll hold your questions for now and pass over to Alan. And share my screen. Um, Hopefully. Can you see that? Can you see it? Yes, we can see it now. Let's make it. Okay. And you can hear me okay? Yep, we can yeah. hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Robert, for the introduction. And um, thanks, Karen, for the excellent presentation. Um, and thank you all um, for joining us tonight. Um, so I'm going to be coming at this from a veterinary point of view um, and thinking about how we can keep the, basically how, can, how we can keep the calf healthy during the weaning period. Um, and there are, I've broken this down to three main areas really that can challenge a calf around weaning time because weaning is, is particularly stressful for the calf. Um, it involves, you know, we're, we're breaking that maternal offspring bond. We're taking the, the calf away from his mother. Um, we're also taking away from mother's milk um, to start. Um, and that in itself is, is stressful. Um, but during that, this period as well, we are 
you know, subjecting the calf to numerous procedures, you know, so we are, this involves gathering and handling, you know, transporting the calf, um, we'll be, um, you know, injecting the calf, in some cases it might be disbudding and dehorning the calf, we're putting it in a new environment, perhaps mixing with, with, with new stock, um, and also introducing it to a new diet as well. So some of these um, events, I guess, are, are short term or acute, you know, whereas some of them are a bit more prolonged um, and long lasting stressful events, such as being put in a new group of, of calves and, and, and in, in new shed building. And um, I put this um, bit of, of just just to remind me of this paper really that kind of highlights the the effect of of stress on the immune system. So stress, you know, is is what happens in the body is that you get a release of what's called stress hormones, and one of them is called cortisol. And this Irish study kind of showed um, a, a significant impact on the ability of immune cells to function um, in in uh, in in wind calves. Um, the, um, then combined with stress, you know, we, we are subjecting the calf to a change in its environment, event, whether we win outside or inside, but eventually they will, in most cases, they will be housed. Um, and we'll be, um, subjecting the calf to significant changes in this environment, um, placing the calf, you know, in close proximity to other calves, meaning that there is an increase in disease pressure in, in a house situation. Um, and if your air quality, ventilation, you know, um, control uh, moisture levels in the shed is, is, is not right, um, if, if the shed is overstocked, etc., then that increases the uh, kind of exacerbates the problem and makes matters worse. And the final factor is the immunity. And this is a time really when the antibodies of the calf received from its mother, so what we call maternally derived antibodies or cholesterol, are, are in the process of declining. It's a gradual process, but they are declining at this time. Um, and obviously the calf needs to kind of take over and start producing its own antibodies. Um, but this decline in antibodies, you know, is also a, 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 ch a challenge really for the calf to have to deal with and combined all those three things um, is a recipe for an increased risk of disease um, and if we don't manage these kind of three areas well enough you know we, we are um, increasing the risk of disease. So the main problem we see is, is pneumonia um, and the calf has got you know a number of of as we do and as all mammals do have got a number of protective mechanisms against pneumonia there, there are already plenty of bacteria viruses etc in the air and you know we breathe in that air in and out on a daily basis all the time um, so animals have got very effective ways of 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 protecting against against pneumonia um, and preventing these microorganisms from establishing and causing disease so for example you know the airways are lined with mucus, which which trap these microorganisms. They've got like these brush-like microscopic brush-like um, cilia, which are called cilia, but basically they're like a little brush that, that brush these mucus from the lungs into the into the into the nose and out. Um, and you know within that mucus there are various immune cells and immune factors that basically are, are there to kill any bacteria or viruses getting there. But the problem with weaning and the stress, as like I said before, is that it impacts the ability of of the body to to protect. It impacts their frontline ability to protect against pneumonia. Um, and also, when you put them in in a shed and house them together, you know there is just an increased challenge of from from microorganisms that can again increase the risk. Together, they increase the risk of pneumonia. Um, the, the, the potential causes and the main causes of pneumonia are, are, the, are the viruses and the bacteria. So those are the main two categories we see. Um, there's a lot of different viruses, really, that might be contributing, but, but the main ones, the, the, the top three is, is um, I'm not going to go into detail about these, but the top three would be IBR, RSV, and PI3. So IBR 
RSV is respiratory syncytial virus and PIC, which is para-influenza 3 virus. Bovine coronavirus may also be um, playing a part in some situations, some farms. Um, there's, it's, it's still uncertain what role coronavirus does have. Um, it's different to the coronavirus that's been making our lives hell recently. Um, it's a different uh, type of virus, so it's, it's different to COVID. Um, and then in terms of the bacteria, Mannheimia hemolytica, that's the type of pastorella. So you probably will have heard of pastorellas, um, are important causes of pneumonia, but also increasingly so we are seeing more um, pneumonia due to Histophilus somni and Mycoplasma bovis. And we can talk a little bit about how, how to manage these in a bit. Um, so the problem with the impact of pneumonia on the calf, obviously you can cause death and that is a big financial loss, um, but also kind of pneumonias that are not managed early and successfully treated early can become chronic in that you can get chronic injury to the lung um, and that kind of chronic injury can um, can be costly in terms of repeated treatments. It can affect uh, the ability of the calf to gain weight so you might result in, in a poorer uh, live weight gain um, and the calf taking longer to finish. Um, and also kind of chronically injured lungs are, are do seem to be at um, more of a risk of of flaring up again, so at more risk of an acute flare up, and that is that is something we sometimes see when these animals get a, an acute pneumonia on top of a chronic on top of a chronic pneumonia, and and in some cases that uh, can be fatal. You know, those cats can end up dying quite quickly. Um, other potential problems. That, from a health point of view at this time would be um, dietary upsets, you know, so things like bloat or acidosis. And this is why it's quite important to allow a transition period where the calf is allowed to um, get used to the diet. You know, so gradual introduction of a period of a month is, is, is key there really, or even more. Um, and other things like lameness might be might be an issue as well as you know as, as I said house and particularly if you're running them through through a race uh, and into a crush multiple times you know if 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 the handling facilities are not you know you know perhaps substandard you know you could end up with injury to to the hoofs or the lower limbs as well so you could end up with lameness problems as well but we're mainly going to talk about pneumonia um so how can we keep our calves healthy at weaning so We'll consider each point again. So we'll consider stress, the environment, and the immunity. So starting with stress. So trying to minimize stress as much as possible. <clears throat> so um, there's a few studies that have looked at the, the method of, of, of weaning and the impact of that on stress behavior in calves. So what they mean by stress behavior, the, what they'd be measuring is um, things like um, how much time the calf is spending walking and pacing up and down, um, how much time the calf is vocalizing, what I mean by making a lot of noise, how much time the calf is lying down, and how much time the calf is spending eating as well. And what I found, they, there's a few studies that have found that calves which are um, subjected to a more gradual weaning as opposed to abrupt weaning where the calf is separated from the mother and taken away immediately. So it's more gradual weaning. Those calves have shown to display less of those stress factors, you know, so they spend more time eating, they spend less time walking around and making noise, um, which is which is better really because it, it reduces that check in, in growth that you get around weaning time. So ways of, of um, um, Making uh, making winning more gradual is there's two 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 of the main ways I suppose that as talked about is this fence line separation is what they call it basically the calves are separated uh, from the mother uh, by a fence um, whether that's inside or outside but they can still see each other see and smell each other but they obviously can't get to circle the mother. Um, obviously, you need decent fences for that, or, or, or it could be electric fences, I suppose. 
Um, the other way is, is what they call this two-stage weaning. And the first stage of the two-stage weaning involves so um, preventing the calf from suckling the mother so by using these plastic nose flaps. Um, and you leave them in for four days to a week. Um, and then after that, you um, separate, it, separate them all together. And yeah, there's a couple of studies that are kind of showing that they do that, that, that does seem to be less stressful. There's other ways as well. There are other, perhaps other methods and other ways that you find that work well for you. Um, in some cases, it might be better to wean after housing, like like um, Karen um, mentioned before, um, and using things like a creep gate and and allowing the calves to you know kind of walk, go through the keep, creep gate and, and, and almost like self weaning, self wean. Um, other things like calves are tend to be less stressed if they're left in the original pen or field um, that they were initially. Um, in terms of introducing a diet, you want to be thinking about introducing the diet gradually and about four weeks before weaning. And that, the idea there is that the calf gets used to its new diet, in, you know, so um, so by the time of weaning is still consuming kind of a good uh, level of feed. Um, and also by introducing it gradually, you, you reduce the risk of digestive upsets, such as acidosis. Um, then around winning time, there's a lot of procedures that take place um, as, so for example, vaccination, you know, worming, um, perhaps in some cases, dehorning, etc. You want to try and avoid doing everything the same day if you can. So, you know, doing everything the same day is, is a, is a he, large amount of stress. So try and, if you can, uh, spread out these jobs. Um, if you are castrating and dehorning, then using pain relief, so using kind of local anaesthetic. Um, as a, so if you're dehorning, you're using local anaesthetic around the you know, base of the horn, together with um, an injection of an anti-inflammatory pain relief um, is, um, is also shown to be um, well, it's shown to be an effective pain relief, but also kind of reduces stress as well as uh, by uh, by doing that. Um, and then, secondly, managing the environment. So we talked a bit, quite a bit about this in the uh, in the meetings that we had um, in the spring, early summer, and, and again, it's a case of um, particularly with pneumonia, sort of the air quality is important. Um, so making sure you've got a good level of ventilation in the building, you've got fresh air coming in, that is an exchange of, of air, you know, kind of regular exchange of air. And then, um, then also the second thing is, is moisture levels in the air, and that's a reflection of the amount of humidity that is, um, and, and the amount of condensation that is occurring in, in the shed, and also how dry your bedding is. And particularly bedding is important to that your bedding is is very dry and um, is 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 well bedded and straw would be the preferred bedding material. Um, thinking about stocking rates, avoid overstocking them. Um, avoid mixing uh, calves, particularly of different age groups. You know, um, try and try and keep them to to the similar groups they were before, and also try and avoid mixing. Um, well, definitely avoid mixing them with boating calves, um, which can quite easily bring in, you know, kind of nasty microorganisms like you know, bacteria like Mycoplasma bovis. So um, the boating calves are better, if possible, um, kept in a separate airspace. And then the other thing as well is, is some of you might, several, several of you might do this, but clipping the calves back um, is, is a, might, um, help as well and, and it helps the calves control the temperature and avoid overheating really um, and that can can help um well it's hard to say if it does help really but i mean it would seem logical that it would help um we i haven't found any decent studies to support that but i think it's, it's a quite a common procedure that that gets that is carried out um and um i think there's maybe a reasonable um reason for doing it and then finally, is in, we're talking about immunity, and here I'm talking about vaccination. Um, I would strongly encourage you to discuss this with your vet um, because every farm is different um, in terms of there's a lot of vaccines out there. Um, 
covering your viruses and the bacteria um, and containing various combination of these bacteria and different drug companies make different vaccines. Um, but things you might need to think about is that how often can you get them in before housing? Because we would strongly recommend that you know the last vaccine and the vaccination course is completed at least two weeks before they are housed or before that you know kind of risk period. So in some situations, it's a case of giving a single dose up the nose, but in another situation, you need to give two doses um, four weeks apart. You know, so. You need to take into consideration your ability to get them in and also your handling facilities as well. So for intranasal vaccines, those vaccines that go up the nose, do you have um, do you have the a, a crush that is going to enable you to, um, or do you have are you going to be able to res, you know restrain the the head of each calf and administer the vaccine up the nose, or do you have a crush you know with with those. Um, what's called the scoops at the, at the front of them in order to restrain the head, which makes giving a vaccine up the nose much easier. Or it might be easier in, in your case to to inject them into the muscle or under the skin and just you know have have them in a race and then just walk along and jab them. And um, so you need to take that into consideration. You know, handling facilities. Also, take into consideration any any problems you've had in the past or any diagnoses you've had in the past. Um, because that can also determine what kind of um, vaccines you, you are going to be using. Um, in particular, so for example, if you've had a di if you have problems with mycoplasma bulbis, for example, you could <clears throat> you, you can look to to vaccinate against that, but you don't you, you don't necessarily need to vaccinate against mycoplasma bulbis if you haven't had a problem with that in the past. Um, so it's hard to so it's hard to give kind of a one one um to prescribe one solution to everybody i guess so that's why i recommend speaking to your vet um the however it's probably recommended that everybody vaccinates against um the three main pneumonia viruses so ibr rsv and pi3 so whether you choose to go for the vaccines up the nose or into the muscle or under the skin depends on your situation and it's probably a good idea to vaccinate against pastorella as well so pastorella is um because it's a nasty pneumonia acute pneumonia um and it can either kind of act alone or or it, or it can um come second to uh viral infections what you tend to get is you get a primary if you like virus infection uh, virus pneumonia, and then put this pastoral that comes in secondary. And then that's an optional. There are vaccines out there against various bact these bacteria, Mycoplasma bovis and Histophilus somni. Um, as I said, aim to complete the vaccination course about two two weeks before housing. So in that, so if you're using a vaccine that needs two doses, you need to be thinking about this, you know, six weeks before weaning, really. So really about now, really, because you know if you give the first jab now towards the end of August, you know, second jab towards the end of September, um, and then you know, mid-October, they will be fully protected. I've just, um, this is just a, a table showing all the different vaccines that are, as, in, as far as I know, and I apologize if I missed something here, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm not promoting, I'm not promoting any of these vaccines. There's just a list of vaccines by alphabetical order, but just to show you that the, the various combinations of licensed vaccines available here in the UK. Um, and, you know, they've all got various combination of, of, of what they protect against, and they've all got various um, ways that they need to be administered. Um, and yeah, your vets will be able to advise in your individual situation. Um, it's also worth considering worms um, and treating particularly lung worm. Um, and lungworm in particular can, uh, pre-existing damage in the lung due to lungworm can increase the risk of pneumonia at housing. So it's a good idea to treat them for lungworm and also gut worms um, at, at weaning as well. Um, and there are, you know, kind of pour on products that makes this very convenient really. Um, and that's a picture of, of, a, of a, a set of lungs with 
heaps of lungworm in their airways. Um, in terms of pneumonia um, and how to manage calf, if, if you do end up with pneumonia in, in, in the calf croc, um, it, early identification of, of, of cases, early diagnosis and early treatment is the key to kind of getting on top of it. In most cases, calves with pneumonia will benefit from early treatment with an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory. Um, an anti-inflammatory in particular has been shown to be useful at taking down the temperature of the calf, reducing the clinical signs, and, and also quite, and even more importantly, reduces the amount of long-term damage that occurs in the lung. And I've talked a little about the problem with long-term lung damage. Um, get your vets involved early as well, because your vets will will take some samples for diagnosis um, and the, the, the early clinical cases that are still showing um, a fever and um, are, are still producing a clear discharge are the best ones to sample. So if you get them in early, ideally before they've even had any antibiotics and the vet will take swabs and they can take blood samples. And I'll give you an idea of what's going on because then you can, you know, you, 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 you can help guide your how you're going to manage it this year, and, and also how you're going to what you're going to do differently next year. And also, post mortem of any dead calves um, can provide you with a lot of valuable information. Um, and these are some pictures of some of the things we do see in these calves. But these uh, quite often in these calves, there are a lot more than one microorganism, virus and bacteria at play. Um, and quite often post-mortem examination and examination of these tissues at a microscopic level is, is usually required, you know, to try and decipher what which one is significant and which what, what kind of combination of bacteria and what role each virus and bacteria is playing. Uh, so so I highly recommend if you get any dead calf to send them down to your nearest uh, SRUC vet. Um, veterinary laboratory. So um, that is all for me. Um, I'll hand you back to Robert, but thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Alan. Do you want to unshare your screen just so we get... Ah, yes, sir, yes, of course. Perfect. And if, Tim, if you want to put your webcam on, you're getting some of these questions too. So a, a big thank you, Alan. That was excellent. Covered a lot of bases there. Um, we've got a pile of questions come in, some through the Q&A. Actually, some came in to me through email and various other ways of a couple of texts and things. So there's quite a bit to get through. Um, Karen, just a nice, some nice practical ones to start with. A creep feeding and bruised barley. Is it okay just to use straight bruised barley in a creep? Ah, good question. Good question. Um, I, it's not something I'd be recommending, but I do know people that do it and haven't had any problems. I think um, the, the only thing is if you if you do it when the calves are young and start them on that when they're eating very small amounts and then build up, um, you know, nine times out of ten, you can get away with that. However, you've got to remember as well, you've got um, high starch feeds, so it's risky for, for acidosis and bloat and things. You've also got to remember there's no minerals in there either, and also it's quite low in protein. So actually intakes might not be as good. Um, I know that the Monitor Farm up in Elgin um, did a wee trial um, when they were, I think it was 10 years ago when they were Monitor Farm, and um, they were feeding straight barley and they tried half the calves with a, a normal feed and half of barley and they saw absolutely no difference in the um, weight gains at all. But it's not something I particularly recommend for the risk factors there um, that I've just explained. Um, yes, yeah. hope that makes so sense. Yes. Proceed with <laughs> caution. Um, yes. yeah. the, and it's a, it's a reasonable question for a year like this when, you know, feed is going to be dear but it's always yeah. important to keep in mind that that's the best conversion we're going to get and and even a yeah. deer feed is a great investment into yeah. a campaign. I think I mean there's the, the alkaline treatments of barley which certainly make them a bit safer as well um, but the other thing I think you need to watch out for is if they get a coarse night or something and the calves are all you know congregating around the creep feeder and they've not got a lot of forage available I mean that's when you do see you know in the morning the odd dead calf and it's, it's just because of, you know, they've, they've not had anything else to eat. So I think, again, making sure that there's enough grass or other forages available to um, to them on a, on a course night. Perfect. Thanks. And another two for you, Karen, while you're on the screen. Um, 
how soon af- after making silage can we get it analysed? I would leave, leave it six weeks. Six mm-hmm. weeks, cool. Yeah. And a, also, how do we test the protein of a forage? So I, I wonder right. if that one there, there's obviously the silage question and also the grass question. Right, okay. The silage, you can get the protein done easily on a silage. It's called near infrared reflectance spectrometry. So it's a um, NIR test and it's very, it's cheap to do. Um, you can either get it done through SAC or through a feed company um, and you'll get an idea of protein on silage there. Um, if it's a high dry matter forage, so really dry haylage or hay, you're better getting it done by a wet chemistry test. So that's um, the, 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 the proper chemistry um, side of the lab and they'll do a protein test there, which is a lot dearer to do. Um, you can tell a lot by looking at it as well, if it's very stemmy and, or if it's, if it's lush or, or whatever. So um, yeah, that's, that's the main analysis parts of it though. Yeah. Is it fair as well, Karen, to say that if you're in, you know, the, the country's pretty, had a pretty diverse range of summer weather and there's some particularly dry areas with a, that are short of forage. If you are in that position where you're short of forage, you know, you can get a dry matter a lot quicker than six weeks and, and start budgeting and planning yes. to, just to, to get an idea of where we're going to be. Definitely, definitely. And um, and I think as well, if you've, you know, some people think they've maybe got less silage, but actually if it's drier, you might have, you know, a wee bit more than you thought as well, just because the number of bales are less, it might be drier or, or you know, the quality might be different. So definitely worth having a look at. And it's, it doesn't take long to have these discussions and give you a bit of peace of mind. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks, Karen. Alwyn, um, a question here about lungworm. Do most farms have lungworm you, nowadays, climate change, wetter weather? Are we seeing lung, lungworm on most farms now pre-weaning? Um, no, not, not necessarily, no. I don't think um, we, I think it, it depends on, it, I think it can vary according to year, you know, so if it's been a particularly wet and warm year. Um, I, the risk of them also depends on you know how much grass the calves are, are eating as well. So older calves, you know, eating more grass would would be a, a, a more risk of having lung worm. You know, if they stay out longer, um, they will have more chance in the back end to you know kind of in the autumn to pick up more lung worm as well. So um, we don't not I don't think every farm will necessarily have have lung worm problem. Um, one thing you could do is you could test um, your calves. You could do a fecal test or get some fecal samples from 10 calves and you can see if there are um, lung worm larvae there in their feces. And then you can use that to guide whether they need treated or not. Um, but um, yeah, whereas, you know, autumn born calves, for example, will, you know, are at a much greater risk because they're, they're eating way more, you know, a lot, a lot of grass, you know, in late summer and the autumn, whereas spring born calves, you know, are, are maybe not con- consuming as much, um, but it would vary according to farm. You know the, the type of pasture they they're grazing, how long they've been on the, the pasture, um, and the weather really. So it varies. Yeah. And I suppose that that spring calf as well is more exposed because it's about to get very stressed and very, you know, it's yeah. a, a bigger, more challenging time time of its life maybe. So, and yeah. if we're sampling, you know, if we're taking dung samples, is that just another do it through your vet job or direct through the SIC lab? No, you could do that yourself. Actually, you could just, you know, um, collect some fresh muck samples. You know, if you say if you're collecting 10, collect it into 10 separate uh, containers and then just send it into us. Like that. You, can, you can drop that off the lab or, or you can stick in the post, I guess. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. And also, feel free, anybody, if you've got any other questions to put in, feel free to keep them coming. Uh, there's plenty of time left to have a, a bit more discussion. Uh, Tim, this one's for you. Um, if your neighbour has a problem with Mycoplasma bovis, and we know there's some pretty grim examples, because of that, should I be considering vaccinating? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's, it would depend on the level of contact between yourself and your neighbour. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily uh, have 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 uh, contracted it uh, in that circumstance. Um, 
most respiratory pathogens have a, and there, and there are definitely exceptions to this, but most respiratory pathogens have a, a limit of about three meters in terms of if a, if a calf's coughing and spluttering, uh, the dike side, uh, about three meters is is a safe distance to be away. It's, it, it's, we're really familiar with this now with COVID, isn't it? You know, the, the closer we are and the longer we are indoors and all that, it makes a huge difference. Um, so it would be all about your boundaries and shared equipment or, you know, that that uh, the, the level of contact between you and your neighbour. Um, we've certainly seen across Scotland, across the UK, an increase in how frequently we're di diagnosing mycoplasma uh, in both beef and dairy units. Um, so it is increasingly common. And if you're seeing poor response to therapy or um, some sp specific clinical signs, in including head tilt and ear, ear droop with, with the pneumonia, um, then, then it would be worth, as Alwyn had suggested, get your vet out to take samples um, and check it out. But yeah, probably not. Don't go by what your neighbour's doing. You know, watch your own stock and, and go by what's what's in your own place. And and what about Tim? That so the twin on calf. If we're looking at the whole looking at the whole cycle, the twin on calf is obviously a risk when it comes on the holding. So you know, as a a as a baby calf, it's an issue for for scours and things. Does it also present an issue? You know, if it came on in in March, is it, it is, does it still present a disease issue? To weaned calves later in the cycle, in the cycle, or is it now part of my herd? Has it got my bugs? Yeah, it's somewhere in the middle. It, it, it could potentially. I think. I think um, you'll definitely see. You know, not blaming the the what the one the one twin on calf that you bought in, but certainly where we see herds mixing or new calves coming in, you don't always get the major disease breakdown at at that point in time. It quite often, let's say two or three animals have come in carrying a new pathogen, you might not see that until the stressful events that Alwyn's outlined really well kick in. And, and it just it, it's those stressors that allow that new pathogen to get going. So unfortunately, I would say, yeah, it does, it does still present a risk. Um, um, it, it, it's not necessarily the case that it's spread anything it's going to spread and, and, and contracted anything that's going to get in, in the first few weeks of it being on farm, it, it could well be the first major stressor on that group will allow mycoplasma or histophilus or whichever new strain of Mannheimia uh, to, to suddenly spread. And, and certainly, I suppose, when we look at the the overall economics of the job at the moment, if, you know, cull cows are worth way more than a £1,000 at the moment, the the reality of the, the thing is the twin on, twin on calves probably a thing um, whether it's a thing of the past or it's certainly few and far between that it would be the, the preferred option that killing the cow is probably the or almost certainly the best option in most scenarios um, Yeah, I, I, I think it would be hard to argue against that although although it's, it's very commonly done nobody likes to see a good cow go and, and you know, a big bag of milk, all those things um, so I do understand the sort of um, the stockmanship element of let you know we've worked hard to get her there, let's use her um, but I think we should we should balance that with the real, the real risk of disturbing you know, a herd that's kept in, in in reasonable good isolation from other herds does 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 develop a stable endemic population of bugs, which there's generally very high herd immunity to. And every time you disrupt that by adding an animal in, you are risking you are risking a breakdown. Um, so yeah, just just making making that making that decision on on bringing stock in in that circumstance with a with a clear view on what that might do to disturb the the bugs that are on your bugs that are on your herd. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. There's a question, I think, to, to both vets. So we've obviously had a fairly significant a vaccine discussion globally in the last few while. Has the COVID vaccine impacted, has the manufacture of COVID vaccine had any impact on availability of respiratory vaccines for, for cattle? I, I'm not sure. Do you, do you know, Tim? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it to you if you do. No, no, I don't. I don't, have, I don't have a really good answer. I think, I think it has. Uh, I think it's affected so so much of manufacturing, um, yeah, not just because factories are pulled away. You know, I, I don't. I don't think it's quite the case that factories mm -hmm. that were producing um, cattle vaccines are all of a sudden pulled in to produce COVID vaccines. But I think all of manufacturing. We, we, we've had major issues with supply on our test kits um, because plastics are suddenly not available and these are not available. And and, and it's all related to COVID, but not um, 
yeah, I think staff absences and, and economic shutdowns and whatnot. So yeah, I think indirectly there has been an impact on on supply chains generally. And anecdotally, I'm not in practice. I think that's why both Alan and I are, are looking at yeah. shifty because neither of us are prescribing these medicines regularly. So we're not we're not really at the coal face in that way. Um, but anecdotally, I think there has been some localized short term issues in, in vaccine supplies. Um, but I can I can speak more specifically than that. Yeah. But again, speak speak to vet, speak to your vet, and make sure you've got what you yeah. need. Um, yeah, yeah, d definitely. And and I guess a good thing in terms of respiratory vaccines is that there's a really, as I would show, a really wide range available. And even if you've got you know a strong affinity for a particular uh, particular type that you've used previously with good good success, the chances are your vet will be able to help you find something that's broadly similar if you are you know, tried and tested isn't available short term, then there's probably something else that is. Excellent. And it, Alwyn, I think probably a scenario to give you here would be to, to kind of get this question across. If there's several handlings to be done, so if we've got, and we, we know that polled bulls would reduce stress, we know that entire males would reduce stress, but if we're in the situation, we're working with steers, that have got horns on them, they're about to be weaned, so we're weaning, clipping, uh, yeah. dehorning and castrating. You said we don't do it all in a winner, but mm. how how much time do we want to leave between, you know, what what practically and, and what would the ideal situation be to to get the stress levels back down before we give we yeah. it back on? Yeah, it's an interesting question. You do wonder whether, you know, getting it all done all at once, you know, whether that would be better than prolonging it. But um in order, in terms of you know, kind of distributing the stressors, I think um, it will it will be useful to your if your vaccination, I guess, to be your your guiding point. So if you are um, if you're giving two vaccines, you know, four weeks apart, you know, the first vaccine you can you could vaccinate in that time plus you know do some of the procedures and then do some of the procedures. The other procedures are the second vaccination, you know, sort of four weeks apart, you know, so. If you can leave, you know, if you can spread them out over a, over a month period, then that would be that would be ideal, I think. Yeah. Excellent. And again, I think to to both is so when we're weaning the cow, when we're taking the, that calf off the cow, there's actually two calves involved. So there's a calf at foot, and then there's a, the fetus in the cow. How exposed is the fetus? You know, is that stress? Does that have an impact? Is that something we need to worry about in the system as well, or is that just a, a natural process that needs to happen? Yeah, um, go on. It, it's a good question. I, I think generally it's 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 not a very high risk point um, for the cow. Uh, sorry, for the fetus. Uh, for the for the fetus, it's developing through um, the the their their. You could argue that it's harder to see it, and maybe maybe these animals just present as a as PD negative. But but a cow that's even got a reasonable size fetus would, would often show at least some some level of discharge issues the boar. And and I don't think we really see commonly see spikes in in, in fetal loss around weaning. So I I would probably put on that we don't need to worry too much about the uh, too much about the developing fetus. The major challenges that are going to come in the uh, in the coming months, going into winter, um, housing, forages, um, water quality, etc. I think I think that's where the major major challenges to the fetus are coming. Um, so I, I wouldn't be worrying too much about uh, weaning. You don't you don't want undue handlings. You don't want un unnecessary stress. Um, but generally speaking, low, low risk period, I would say. Yeah, excellent, perfect. Thanks. And a final question to everyone is. Um, you know, climate change, we hear about climate change all the time. And I think certainly in the autumn, I think most farmers would now accept or, or support the fact that the climate is different to what it used to be. And we're seeing a lot of mild weather, mild wet weather. That means housing is earlier, but still, you know, perhaps we're in the teens of degrees, a uh, very humid conditions as well. Do, are, are we likely to see, is climate change going to cause bigger pneumonia issues going forward? And do we need to change these systems based on that? Uh, could I, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I think we probably can't 
overestimate the effect that um, humidity and temperature um, can can have on uh, on risk of pneumonia um, in poorly ventilated sheds. Um, so where you are, um, where you, where there's already an inadequate um, ventilation of that shed, and, and you and you add in extremely poor weather, particularly a lot of our sheds are wind ventilated, so they're inadequately ventilated without wind. And and when we see that when we see that wind drop in warm weather, it, it can be a really substantial challenge. So um, I, I, I think, I guess my answer would be that I, I think probably not in, in really well-designed housing, um, which is going to stack ventilate effectively, hopefully, you know, regard, regardless of, of external uh, climate, but in poor buildings, it might make it worse um, as a starter. But I don't know what Karen and Alan's thoughts are. Anything to add either? I'm not um, add. No, good answer. <laughs> yeah, great answer too. Um, it's it's going to add. It's it's you know kind of it's offers a perfect recipe really for pneumonia, doesn't it? Like the the, the change really and this warmer weather, wetter weather, um, and I think it's it just it's, it's such there are sort of many aspects to kind of try and look after you know try and prevent pneumonia you know like. Um, not just you know because like your, your ventilation in your shed etc is extremely important but also like ensuring that your diet is right you know that the, the stress you know you have some other stress um, you minimize stress you know and and you you get your vaccination rights etc you know is is it makes all it makes that kind of all like holistic approach even more important you know? so yeah I think that's all I have to say Brilliant. Cool. Um, certainly, yes. So that's excellent. Thank you very much. I'm conscious of everyone's time uh, and there are lots of other questions here that would be uh, certainly worth the next hour we could take to, to question and answer because that's been quite enjoyable too. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. But happily, uh, our next calf crop meeting is actually on Thursday evening. Same, same deal uh, on Zoom. Uh, hopefully our technology end of things will be a wee bit more uh, functional for us uh, and avoid that flapping at the start. So, uh, yes, we'll see you, hopefully see you all on a Thursday where uh, Tim and Karen will focus more on the cow um, and then plenty of time for more discussion there. There was a good question there actually about um, where the recordings for these are, are actually held. Uh, the answer is various places, but what we'll do is uh, send them out to, to all participants. Uh, we'll send them out just uh, tomorrow, so you've got your own copy of it. Uh, and that, that means it's almost all these modules have come together and you can uh, have access to them when you, whenever you need them. So with, with that, uh, hopefully we'll see you on Thursday. I'd just like to take this chance to First of all, thank the uh, UIF funders, for, uh, without whom we wouldn't be here today. And secondly, thank uh, our two main speakers, Alan and Karen, and also Tim for uh, some valuable contributions as well. So a big thank you and hopefully see you on Thursday. <laughs>